I'll, I'll go ahead and start them. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys, everyone, for being here again in the second part. I know it's kind of long to hear me talking for almost four hours, <laughs> but now we are getting more to the to the point of the talk, but I, I wanted to build this uh, uh, basic concepts before because I didn't know exactly if all the audience has this, this, this basic knowledge and I, I think there are also people from that are not petroleum engineers so I thought it, it was a good idea to go for this overview and then now we can focus on, on rock fluid interactions and basically on wettability uh, and in the end I will show you some case studies uh, uh, from from Brazilian result uh, that I don't know if everyone is familiar with, but it's uh, I think I thought since the talk is not a uh, not scoped in South America, I thought it was a good idea to give a, an overview of a different part of the world for you guys. Uh, so let's go for for this second part. Um, okay, so in, in the beginning, since this is a series of uh, enhanced or recovery talks. Uh, I just wanted to talk with the fineness uh, enhanced or recovery and, and the, the, the most common enhanced or recovery methods. Uh, but I wanted just to, to say, well, usually when we talk about DOR, we are talking about uh, uh, in mostly in, in the declining phases of the fields and when uh, water flooding, we have high, high water productions or uh, lower oil productions. And usually what we want is to increment oil. And basically what we measure is the incremental oil projections that we will have compared to if we continue doing whatever we were doing before, like a, a primary recovery, that is usually not the case anymore, but a water flooding, secondary recovery. So what might makes a, a EOR project interesting? Uh, we have varieties of EOR projects. Uh, from Wagi in offshore fields here in Brazil, we have a polymer uh, in China, in Argentina, you have uh, CO2 in the US and a lot of projects uh, in different locations, but all of them uh, want the same, right? All of them want to increment all recovery, so recover more or recover faster, and it translates into profits. So it translates into uh, getting uh, more lucrative or getting more uh, revenues or get the revenues in a shorter time yeah uh, but there are also drawbacks so uh, there's there are reasons why companies are not uh, implementing eor uh, projects or procedures uh, as part of the, the the basic operations everywhere to get uh, to the last drop of oil and that's basically because they are complex so they need investment additional investment uh, they have risk you don't we have to model complex interactions and we will see it's, it's, it's hard to know uh, how the, the, the displacement display will happen or how the, the formation will react because we may try to inject uh, some fluid to, in, to enhance recovery because we know it will affect the oil in some point, uh, way, but then maybe we were not thinking that it will be also interact with the rock and it will create damage in the rock and, or it will a form uh, emotions that I can, cannot remove or it will uh, get formation damage because it will uh, uh, increase injection pressure as high as I, I cannot uh, go. Uh, so this, all these risks we have to take into account. And then also another challenge is like injecting a different fluid, if, uh, water treatments, uh, logistics to get uh, the resources, logis logistics to adapt. Uh, existing from uh, uh, the existing platforms that we have uh, or the rigs uh, in order that maybe they were not prepared to to we to, uh, to inject your projects uh, so all of this has to be taken into account and the idea I, I just started with this introduction because understanding the rock fluid and fluid fluid interactions is very important to build that dynamic models uh, so if we were thinking about uh, how we are going to estimate production and foreseeing the challenges of, of, of the projects on recovery projects, uh, we uh, need to know how fluids interact uh, within themselves and how they interact with the rock. 
And this is very, uh, sometimes we, have, we know that the reservoir engineering books have a, all of them defined wettability, but many people really know why it's important to know the wettability, but we will see that it actually affects uh, everything when we are talking about uh, water flooding. And if we go to enhance or recovery, it goes even farther. So uh, we, we need to have a good characterization of rock fluid interactions. So basically when we talk about uh, EOR or, or recovery in general, we talk about recovery factor and the recovery factor is basically a produce, a cumulative produce oil in standard conditions over the oil original oil in place that is also measured as standard conditions. Uh, and well, this is the, basically the most important parameter and all the efforts in EOR are to increase the recovery factor. Uh, and in, in this case, we can see that the recovery factor has two components and it's the product of these two components because we cannot uh, look at one uh, overseeing the other one because they are interrelated. So we cannot have a horrible uh, sweeping efficiency, uh, volumetric sweeping efficiency, uh, because even if the pro product that we are going to inject has a, a enhancement, a great enhancement on the displacement efficiency, it won't be useful if it doesn't get to sweep the reservoir. And also we cannot uh, only have a perfect sweeping efficiency if we are not modifying the displacement efficiency and we are not decreasing the residual oil saturation because that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't justify the, uh, the costs of having an EOR project. So uh, for that, so in some cases, we would just want uh, to focus on, on, on the sweeping efficiency. Like for example, when we have polymer injection in some specific cases, uh, but uh, the idea of, of a complete EOR project is to actually increment or play with both. So when we talk about the volumetric uh, sweeping efficiency, we have the aerial efficiency and the volumetric and the vertical efficiency and the product of, of of those is the volumetric sweeping efficiency that is also seen as a, a macroscopic efficiency. Uh, and it's actually the, the fraction of the, the whole pore system that will be contacted by the fluid that we are injected and that be, will be swept. And the parameter we use to, to characterize this is the mobility, uh, mobility ratio between, between the displacing and displaced fluid. Uh, we talked about this before as one of the objectives of the EOR in the first part. So uh, the mobility ratio is basically the relationship between the mobility of the displaced uh, fluid, uh, uh, displacing fluid and the displaced fluid. So we, we can see that it has the relationship of uh, relative permeability over viscosity for the displacing and displaced fluid. And what we want is, is to uh, decrease the mobility ratio to improve uh, sweeping and with that we will get a more homogeneous homogeneous sweeping front uh, and a greater super efficiency that will uh, that means that the fluid that we are injecting will uh, uh, increment the, the fraction of the area that will uh, contact and sweep now when we are talking about the displacing efficiency we have we basically we are we calculate it in terms of the uh, residual oil when compared to the initial oil saturation. Uh, and, and we determine this uh, in terms of the capillary number that will be the ratio of viscous to uh, capillary forces. Um, we basically, when we are at residual oil saturation uh, conditions after water flooding, EOR processes, what they look is to increment the, the capillary number over a critical value. And with that, we, we need an increment of some orders of magnitude. We will discuss this later. But, uh, but we, usually we can achieve this or but uh, modifying the interfacial tension. So we decrease interfacial tension, we increase the capillary number or modifying uh, wettability alterations as there are some EOR research projects in which we can inject uh, fluids that interact with the rock and then we'll, they will make the, the rock more water wet, for example. So uh, reducing the interaction of the rock with the oil, powering the displacement of oil from the small pores. Uh, 
Okay, so talking about, I, I'm not going to go through the whole, the whole lecture of uh, water flooding and fountain advancement because uh, there's, it's, it's not the point here, but I wanted just to show uh, in a very summarized version uh, how rock fluid, in, why rock fluid interaction will affect, impact the sweeping efficiency. As you can see on the left, we can see the fraction flow over saturation plot in which uh, we can use this as a, as a very simplified uh, frontal advancement model uh, in order to calculate the average uh, water saturation at the breakthrough. And with this, uh, we, we can use this, this uh, uh, frontal advance model to, to do very simplified um, simulate, uh, calculations of, of displacement in, in, in mystical flood, like in water flooding. Uh, uh, we can see it in the figure in the figure on the left, in which we can see for the frontal advancement and the and the front, the front that advances uh, from the injector to the producer. And what is important about this model is that basically behind the the uh, the front, the average water saturation is a constant, and it will be constant until the breakthrough. So if this will displace at, at an, uh, a uniform way. It will be uh, advancing uh, in such a way that we have a constant uh, average saturation before uh, behind the front, and above the front we have the the parts that haven't been contacted. So until the breakthrough, the water breakthrough, we will have in this very simplified linear model we will have uh, the con the continuous rate of injection if we uh, continuous rate of oil production if we inject at the at a constant rate. And then after the breakthrough, we will start having an increase in the water saturation, right? Because uh, water has already uh, uh, reached the producing well, and we will have an, incre an incremental in the outlet uh, saturation, and with that, an incremental in the average saturation after breakthrough. But that was all just to show that when we characterize this displacement, we need to know two mobilities, basically the mobility of the water, uh, before the breakthrough, we, have, we need to know the mobility of the water in the, what we call the water bank or at the, at the advanced front. Or and we, have, we need to know the mobility of the oil in the non-invaded zone. So this, the water will be displacing uh, in the front and the oil will be coming from the non-invaded zone. And with that, we can calculate mobility ratios. And, and since uh, we, we know that below, behind the front, we have an average uh, saturation of water that is constant that we calculate with this uh, curve on the left. Uh, and uh, ahead of the front for the, 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 the relative permeability, we need to evaluate it at the initial water saturation that also needs to be a known parameter. And then uh, if we go to the figure on the, on the right, we, we know that we, we can calculate the mobility ratios uh, before or after breakthrough uh, at the indicated points over there. But what I wanted to make clear is that all of this is dependent on the relative permeabilities, even at the uh, average water saturation at the breakthrough or at the initial conditions or the endpoint, or then at the variable uh, saturation after the breakthrough. So we will see that uh, wettability or rock fluid interactions have a major effect in the, in the relative permeability curves, and therefore they will have a major effect on the mobility ratio that we have. That is basically what we use to, to predict displacement. Uh, even if we do this in a very simplified model, but then when we go to a reservoir simulators, what we do uh, is dependent on, on on calculating saturation and then relative permeability, and then with that, calculating transmissibility across the cells. Now, if we talk about uh, displacement efficiency, uh, well, this is more obvious how the, the, the wettability will affect the displacement efficiency or the fluid fluid also, because we have it explicitly in the capillary number. So the, the the contact angle, the theta that is there, we will see here that is one of one characteristic that can uh, be used to classify wettability. And also the interfacial tension is over there too. So actually both of these uh, parameters have a direct impact on the capillary number. 
So they will have a, a direct impact on the curvature of the interface as we saw in the capillary pressure equations. And they will have a direct impact on how strong the viscosity forces have to be to overcome uh, the capillary forces. So this is just a very, very uh, simplified uh, mo model for, for a model of a, a porous medium. A desaturation curve in which we can see the, resu the, the residual non-wetting and we will assume that wetting and non-wetting it refers to wetting phase as, a, as the, uh, the water and non-wetting as the oil. And for example, when we have, we can see here that we have, uh, both of the curves have a similar behavior. That is after water flooding, we get this constant uh, residual oil saturation. And then there's a critical uh, uh, capillary number at which if we go above this critical capillary number, we will start decreasing the residual oil saturation, right? So that's what uh, EOR seeks uh, in, the, in the incremental recovery factor. So if we have a residual oil saturation at water flooding, if we have a perfect sweeping and we have this residual oil saturation, we need to overcome, overcome the, the capillary, critical capillary number in order to reduce the saturation of, of oil and produce additional oil. So what we can see as the, these curves are depending on, on uh, if the oil is the wetting phase or water is the wetting phase. So you can see that the critical capillary number is much higher for oil as the wetting phase. Uh, so for that, um, that means that uh, if we have a, a, a case in which the rock has a strong interaction with the, with the oil, it will tend to, to, to hold on the oil into the smaller pores. So we will need a higher increment of capillary number in order to get the residual uh, oil saturation uh, reduction. So this is something that we, we usually see in core flooding experiments in which we can see that oil recovery, if we have a, a oil, a oil wet porous medium, we usually, usually will see that the uh, residual oil saturations will be lower because uh, as we will see oil is in the slower pores, it's in the smaller pores. But the thing is that in order to get to this lower residual oil saturation, we need to produce a lot of water. So, Basically, that's, that's why uh, people usually say that for oil recovery is poorer. It's not because the residual saturation will be always greater, it's because it, it becomes uh, uneconomic or impractical because you, need, you, you will have a faster water breakthrough and we, you will have very, very high productions of, of water for a long time. So usually you don't get the final uh, oil recovery that, and that, that you will get that very small uh, residual oil saturations. So with that in mind, we can go to the definitions of uh, 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 wettability. So basically, wettability is uh, the, the relative addition of two solid uh, of two fluids when in contact with the solid surface, and that is a, a, an obvious definition, right? It's a, 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 the, both fluids will compete to see which one likes more or like best and tries to try to cover the same uh, surface area of the solid. Uh, so depending on which one has attraction or repulsion with the solid surface, we will have more tendency to spread of the water or of the oil. And that is very simple to visualize when we have a, a flat surface and a drop of the fluid uh, in a surrounding medium. Like for example, a drop of water in uh, on, a, on a flat surface uh, under air atmosphere. But then it's different when we have a, a porous medium. When we have a porous medium, this will be translated not into a droplet that will only a uh, wet or not wet. It will, it will translate into which fluids will occupy which part of the pores and which type of pores. Because as we know, when we have a porous medium, we have this pore size distribution, pore shape distribution, and also a, a composition of the rock can change throughout the reservoir, right? The minerals. So uh, in, in, this, in this way, we can see that uh, depending on which phase has a higher interaction with the, the, with the rock surface, 
we will find different distributions and different ways of displacement. Uh, and that's very important and we will describe it in the, in the next slides. Uh, also, it's very important to, to, to uh, specify that mineralogy is variable, can be very variable, especially in heterogeneous reservoirs, and then pore size distribution also when we have different textures and different uh, phases, we will have a uh, pore size distribution that can range into very tight and into very vocular or, or huge, particularly carbonates. Uh, and also we have all membrane composition that play a role. So with that in mind, we, can, we need to understand that uh, this is all about a characterization of wettability, but basically what we have is an average wettability, and that will be the most representative for the porous medium and the region that we want to represent. But that doesn't mean that if we measure a contact angle, we can assume that the contact angles will be all the same across the reservoir throughout all the, the uh, the porous space, because we have two factors. We have the factor of uh, uh, compositions of the rock, but also we have the factors of the scales. Uh, so basically what we do, we assess wettability, but then we try to do ways of averaging this wettability, even if we are talking about pore size, uh, pore scale simulations, in which we, we try to find ways to, uh, to uh, incorporate this changes in wettability, or if we are talking to, to reservoir simulation in which we will uh, uh, separate the, the, the field into areas of interest in blocks, and then we can characterize each one of them according to a preferential wettability that we uh, specify for that area. Okay, so for Wettability here, what I say, I will say that I am following the classifications by Donaldson of the wettability book. I, I, there are other classifications of wettability, and some of them are have more states of wettability or fewer. I think this this one is uh, detailed in the subcategories of wettability that I think that for the purpose that we want to talk here, the, the most common or, or, or at least most commonly accepted for the industry is the, was the water wet, basically for sandstones uh, years ago, uh, in which we can consider that over half of the surface will be is, uh, wet by, by water, and water will occupy the smaller pores and the dead end, dead end pores. And that, why is that? Well, that's because uh, when we have a smaller pores, uh, we have a greater contact uh, of the fluid with uh, the rock surface, right, for, for unit of volume. And when we have the larger pores, the larger pores can be invaded easily for capillary pressure reasons, but then the fluid can be in, this, in a larger pore without actually being in contact with the rock. That, that's what's happening in this case. If you see the image there, we will have the, the oil inside the, the larger pores, but then we will have water films. So the, the, the water will be a continuous uh, wetting phase across the whole uh, porous medium, and then the oil uh, will be located in the, in the larger pores uh, in contact with the water films. And then we can form globules that will be that that can be several or most of the pore, pore system uh, connected into into uh, large globules of oil, uh, but that doesn't mean that the oil necessarily will bear injections. We will lose continuity and the and the uh, connectivity across the ganglions. So for this case, we can see on the figure on the on the left. Uh, if this this is in this case, we have a drop of oil, and we can see that uh, uh, I'm sorry, a drop of water, and we can see that the oil phase is surrounding, and we can see that the the, the water tries to spread out, occupying, invading the area that uh, would be occupied by the uh, by the oil external phase. The other extreme is when we have a, a oil wet scenario, and in this case, we have the opposite uh, behavior. So we will have uh, films of oil throughout the core, throughout the, 
the surface area of the rock. And then we will have internal water that will accumulate, particularly in the largest space. Uh, so the water ganglions can also be connected, but then if we had mobilization of oil, uh, we, we can have this, connect, this connectivity. Uh, and for example, if we have, for any reason, we have incre incremental in, uh, saturation of oil at any point of the reservoir, uh, water can be disconnected and can form uh, isolated drops inside the, the, the pore system. And then we have uh, two different that are not in, the, in within the streams. This is fractionally wet. It will have a specific preferential wet abilities distributed across the, the porous medium. So for this, uh, uh, this is very common uh, as a result of uh, primary drainage in which we can have uh, water uh, wet small pores and oil wet uh, larger pores. And the reason of that of this is well, we saw that the capillary pressure for invasion is higher in the smaller pores. So uh, after oil migration, this this uh, very small pores remain has if it, if it has enough surface active components like resins or asphaltines, it can. Uh, interact with the oil and then it can displace water from the larger uh, pores and alter the wettability with time of the larger pores. So in this case we will have we, we won't have a continuous uniform continuous phase as we have we will have uh, zones depending on the k uh, relationships the k is sorry uh, relationships the porosity permeability relationship we will have different pore size distributions and we will have preferential wettabilities uh, for different regions of the core. Oh, sorry, I, I'm, I mixed up both of them. Sorry, I was talking, uh, uh, lost, lost the focus uh, when I was talking about fractional and mixed wet. So what I described before is applies completely for the mixed wet. So I, sorry, I switched the names. Uh, basically, uh, this is exactly what I described before in which we have a, a small pores filled with water and when we have the, the larger pores filled with oil as a result of the migration. And then the fractionally wet, uh, is basically heterogeneity due to mineralogy or heterogeneity due to pore size distribution that causes different regions of the core having different, uh, different preferential wet abilities. And then when we want to represent this, we need to try to separate the effects of the water wet part, the oil wet part, and try to integrate in an upscale core. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, tr I switched names. You can see that I'm not a very big fan of this uh, all names classifications. I think it's more important that you actually understand uh, what the, they mean. That actually how to classify them into mixed, uh, neutral, or Dalmatian, or a lot of other names. Uh, but yeah, basically uh, following the Donaldson classification, fractionally wet will be when we have some portions of wettability, uh, water wettability, and some others of oil wettability distributed along the, the the core due to heterogeneity in the core. And then the mixed wet comes with a smaller pores for a water wet ability, and then the larger pores with oil wet ability. So the, the contact angle is a representation that usually is, as, as we saw in many uh, recent studies uh, doing tomography, uh, high resolution measurements of contact angles and micro models and all these types of studies we know that is mostly a representation more than a, an actual value that will determine all the, the fluids uh, flow across the, the systems. But it's a good representation because it, it gives us a, a direct a visualization of the, uh, the effects of the interfacial tensions between oil and water and interfacial tensions between water and the solid and oil and the solid. So, we, we see that this draw of the droplet, uh, I think is pretty clear because uh, when we have uh, this droplet on the contact of the surface, each uh, interfacial tension force will try to minimize the surface area, its surface area, right? Because that's the tendency of the interfacial tension is to try to get to the minimum surface area. That's because as we saw before, uh, we have excessive energy at the interface. So, Minimizing the energy means minimizing the number of molecules at the interface. 
So in this case, we, we, we can see that uh, the oil water interfacial tension and the water solid interfacial tension uh, will try to, uh, to push this, uh, this droplet uh, inwards and then the oil solid will try to uh, pull this water outward, uh, this, this droplet outwards uh, in order to maximize its contact and avoid the contact of the oil uh, with, the, with the surface. And when we do a, a perform, we perform a force balance uh, in, at the interface, this is a very simple way to see it, but we get the Young's equation in which we see the uh, differences between the uh, oil solid and the water solid are related to the uh, oil water interfacial tension, but, but more importantly, to the uh, cosine of the angle, of the three phase angle uh, between the droplet and the solid uh, surface. So with that, uh, we can use this as, as a, a measurement or a way to characterize wettability, knowing that uh, when, we, when, when we, we measure, if we have a way to measure the contact angle, we will have a way to see at least how strong or weak the relationships between oil uh, and solid and brine and solid are. In terms of free, free, uh, uh, free energies of interaction, we have the Gibbs Young equation that was a posterior uh, development uh, for this, and we can see that basically the cosine of the of, of the angle will be related to the difference between the energy of interaction between the water and the solid surface, and the oil and the solid surface. And you can see in the equations on the top that that will be a, a directly related to the interfacial tensions between the solid. And the oil for the energy inter uh, solid and the oil for the energy interaction with the oil, and the water and the oil for the energy or in of interaction with the water, and then we have a role of the energy of the solid surface under vacuum that that will determine if the sol surface has a strong energy or, or weak energy. But we look that with all that in mind, if we have a strong water solid interaction, we will have this positive uh, term in here, so we will have a cosine of the angle. Uh, uh, lower than 90 degrees. So as, a, as a, in the industry, in the oil industry, usually uh, uh, what, is more, what is common is to measure the, the contact angle through the denser phase. So if we have a water brine system, we will measure the contact angle towards the uh, brine phase. And with that, we have classifications of contact angles in terms of wettability, and then we have uh, following the classification by Anderson, we have that for contact angles lower than 70 degrees, we have a water wet case. For contact angles between 70 and 110, we have an intermediate wet uh, case. And for contact angles above 110, we have an all wet case. Uh, so there are different types of classifications. Uh, uh, this one is a very, very common one, but depending on, on the procedures, uh, different authors can assume that, for example, there is no neutral wettability and that we have higher than 90 or lower than 90, and then some others will uh, even extend the broad of the range of intermediate wettability. So that depends on, on the criterion assumed to, to classify wettability. And mostly what people do is to try to correlate this to industry standards or industry procedures like AMOT and, and USBM, as we will see in the following parts. So equilibrium contact angles, uh, actually we will measure this wettability uh, for a, a long time and we will let uh, the equilibrium forces set. And, and with that, uh, it will be a characterization of the re initial reservoir uh, wettability. So when we want to characterize initial wettability, we can use equilibrium uh, measurements. Uh, but then for flow displacement, uh, uh, it's common in the industry to uh, refer to advancing or receding contact angles, in which we have the water advancing or the water receding is the waiting phase. And with that, we will have advancing when the water advances, uh, we, will have, we can measure the contact angle. Like for example, it's shown in there in a simple representative device. If we displace the layer on the, the, the surface on the bottom 
we will force advancement of receiving of the gray fluid. And with that, we can measure a dynamic contact angle. Uh, some, some researchers, they, they, they indicate that to represent imbibition, we should measure water advancing contact angles. And to uh, represent drainage, we should measure receiving contact angles. While there are some companies that usually use equilibrium contact angles uh, as the intermediate uh, uh, initial wettability, and they don't really measure because there are some complexities in, in, in actually determining the right dynamic contact angle. So that depends also in the, the, the criterion of the, the researchers. Some people use equilibrium contact angles just as, the, as one contact angle, and then they will do distributions across the core, the core or across the reservoir, and then some other people use this dynamic contact angles for flow simulations. Uh, we can see, we, we also find what we have, what we call contact angle hysteresis. That's the contact angle of advancing contact angle is usually greater than the receiving contact angle. Um, this is caused by wettability changes by aging, as we will see as a major uh, cause, because when you know, the, the history of saturation uh, changes the rock fluid interactions. So when we have uh, uh, water advancing or water receiving, it matters which phase was in contact before with the, with the, with the rock uh, when we measure the contact angle. And also uh, heterogeneities uh, and roughness can also contribute with this because when we measure the contact angle, we can see that we, we, we do an average of the surface but then if we go to a really microscopic contact angle, we can see effects of a roughness and heterogeneity, that basically roughness will make the hydrophobic uh, surface more hydrophobic and the hydrophilic surface more hydrophilic when we talk about equilibrium. So when we go backwards and forwards, these, all these effects, they will have a, uh, an impact on the contact angle that we measure. So that's the main reason why when we measure wire advancing or wire receiving uh, contact angles, we can get uh, this difference. And sometimes it can be so critical that we can have a very uh, large contact angle uh, uh, of water advancing and, uh, and uh, like a 50 degrees or more lower receiving contact angle. So these uh, dynamic effects in contact angles are one of the reasons uh, why we have a, a hysteresis in the PC and KR curves. <clears throat> and this has to be considered because when we model uh, flow, basically we, we use the, the capillary pressure curve, we use them for primary drainage, but then they have an impact in the inhibition also, depending on the wettability we have. And also when we are uh, modeling flow, depending on which phase is it placed in which, which is the wetting phase, uh, we need to know uh, if we have increase, increment or decrease of water saturation in order to know which, which curve should we use. Uh, as we can see, uh, internal and inhibition curves are different, uh, maybe uh, mostly because of the difference in, in advanced and missing contact angle, but also because of the, <coughs> the radius distribution, pore throat and pore body distribution and changes, which produce the in bottle effects. But that means that going forward, incrementing the, the area per unit of volume, uh, or when we go forward or we go backwards, has a different effect depending on which phase wets. Uh, and this causes that when we go uh, through drainage and then we come back through inhibition, we won't go from, from, uh, through the same pathway. So we can see, let's start with the capillary pressure here. We can see that when we have a wetting, uh, fluid uh, de uh, decrease, that is the arrows that go in the decreasing saturation of water. Uh, that's the primary drainage curve. And then we can see that when we come back to the inhibition, we go on the bottom, and that means always the inhibition will go on the bottom. Because in inhibition, we are assuming that we are injecting the fluid that wets, and it's, uh, we expect that we will require a lower effort of capillary pressures <coughs> in order to inject the wetting phase than the non-wetting phase than in the case of the drainage. In the case of, of, the, of the KR curves, we also see the differences. We see the differences in the endpoints and we see the differences in the, in the, uh, in the crossover points. 
uh, even if we consider that we will start from the same point, uh, we see that the, when we finish the drainage curve and then we start the division curve, uh, uh, they won't follow the same pathway and the drainage curve will be typically uh, above the, uh, the division curve for the non-weighing phase and the opposite behavior for the weighing phase. And that is the same, the same case, right? Because in the primary drainage, we assume that the rock is completely, for example, water wet. <clears throat> and in that case, the, the, the relative permeability to the, the, the non-weighted phase will be higher. In the inhibition, we usually measure the inhibition after aging. Uh, and at the initial wettability conditions. And in that case, we will have a, a or less water wettability we will cause uh, uh, some of the, the non-wetting phase to go to a lower. Okay, so flex, uh, and it depends on the type of rock, and it depends on the type of oil and brine that we have. So <laughs> there's no general classification of wettability. There is no way to uh, uh, obtain contact angles, uh, distributions by equations or models, what we can do is to use analog rocks or analog reservoirs to infer in a similar, similar environment. But for that, we need to have a classification of the fluids and the rock and a proper characterization. And with that, I mean, we need to know that the fluids are equivalent. And uh, by fluids, I mean the SAR analysis, the API, and also the acid number and the basic number. Uh, and hopefully the, we, we should have a way to do, perform a further uh, classification and do elemental analysis to see the distribution of carbon, nitrogen, uh, sulfur, and oxygen, and also uh, analysis of infrared spectroscopy to, to analyze functional groups. <coughs> And this type of, of, uh, of characterization that would give us an insight. And then gas chromatography to see the distribution of molecular weights. With all this, we can see if actually the fluids will behave similarly to what we are expecting on trying to, to model. Uh, for the brine, it's usually in, important to know the, the this total dissolved solids and also uh, the concentration of the valent anions and cations, uh, basically calcium, but also strontium, barium, uh, sulfate, because as we will see, <coughs> these divalent cations and anions, they will have a potential to, uh, to change the wettability. Uh, and then for the rock, we need to know the mineralogy, uh, basically, but then that's a complex thing, because usually when we do XRD, we will have the bulk mineralogy, but then we need to know which uh, uh, elements, which uh, minerals will dominate the surface. And for that, usually we do SEM, uh, we do ADS, and we will try to do uh, some other uh, uh, techniques uh, in order to try to characterize on how to investigate on how, on how to get the wettability without actually measuring it. And then basically for most of the cases when we want to build a dynamic model, we will go to, we will have to go to uh, measurements in some kind of, of wettability, and we will go through that in the then in later in the slides. And this table just shows a wettability characterization for uh, for silicate and carbonates, and we can see that we don't have a, a uniform distribution here. We can see Trevor, uh, Morrow, and Chillingar. And yen they, they they classify or in regarding the contact angle or regarding some other techniques, they classify them the percentage of of, uh, of uh, sandstones and of silicate rocks and the percentage of carbonate rocks into water wet, intermediate wet, and oil wet. And we can see that this is not uniform, but what we can see are trends, and that's why the common knowledge of in the industry says that uh, sandstones are basically more water wet and carbonates are basically more oil wet, but that's not always the case. So we have uh, complex behaviors sometimes. 
and we we have cases of of sandstones that can be very active with the with the type of rock of oil that we have, and then we have cases of uh, carbonates that won't be very don't, won't interact very much with the rock. Uh, but mostly, if we if we see the trends, most of the of the sandstones were water wet or intermediate wet, and most of the carbonates were oil wet or intermediate wet. Okay, so the interactions that determine the wettability, uh, as I said before, they are very dependent on the type of surface and type of uh, fluids uh, are based on intermolecular interactions. We don't have time here to go through all of these in details. So this, the intermolecular forces are basic chemistry. So we have the sh short range and we have the van der Waals attractive forces and we have hydrogen bonds. <clears throat> we won't really describe the potential of interaction here uh, depending on the type of, of molecules and type of active sites. Then we have the electro electrostatic interactions that is basically based on the electrical double layer. We have the DLBO theory effects, and then at high uh, ionic potential, we have the non DLBO uh, effects. And then we have the acid base interactions that are basically different active sites that we have depending on the type of rock and different active groups that we have depending on the type of components we have in the oil. So I will go into more detail into the acid-base uh, interactions because uh, it's something that usually is not very much covered in, 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 in typical uh, chemistry or reservoir engineering courses. And I think it's interesting to, to understand how this can be important to define the wettability in different cases. But before that, uh, we can see this review from Buckley and Liu. Uh, in which they classified uh, wettability alteration during the aging process. We know that the aging is the process in which we have contact between the oil and the, and the rock. And with this contact, there are some interactions that can happen through time that will change the wettability. So if we take a mineral, initially it will be water wet. That's why we usually model the primary drainage as a water wet procedure. Uh, but then after contact with the oil, uh, and if we, we allow enough time of contact with the oil, we will have these interactions that can alter the wettability towards more oil wet uh, that can be either or, or not strictly totally water wet or then go to some intermediate wettability or, or can even turn into oil wet. So this, the four type of interactions, they classify this uh, polar interactions, actually what we call intermolecular forces in the previous slide, in which we have polar compounds uh, in the in the uh, oil, and then they will have uh, in, in, they will interact with sites which have uh, incremented charge distributions throughout the rock, and with that we can have uh, an attraction that can uh, end up with uh, uh, the the location of these mole molecules on the rock surface, and with that uh, altering the wettability. We have a thin precipitation. Uh, as you know, asphaltines are basically not dissolved in the oil, they are uh, suspended in the oil. And they will be in equilibrium suspended uh, when solvent. So usually it needs a resins or polar compounds to stabilize it because asphaltines uh, have a, a lot of functional groups and they won't be stable in a, in a totally non-polar solvent like uh, a paraffin. So when we have this type of uh, uh, loss of equilibrium, for some reason, uh, a contact, uh, the alpha things are in contact with paraffins or, or regions of the reservoir that have more paraffinic oil, we can have asphaltine precipitation and this precipitation can in turn uh, cover the rock of the surface, creating completely oil wet uh, areas. Also, as we said before, we have the acid-base interactions uh, in which we, we will have uh, acid sites uh, in, on the rock that can interact with basic compounds. And then we have uh, basic sites on the rock that can interact with acid compounds. And this will be all a function of uh, uh, basically the pH that we have on the reservoir. Uh, so we will discuss this later. 
And then I am binding uh, basically uh, divalent uh, anions and cations uh, like calcium, for example. Uh, they have the ability uh, to go in between negative surface si uh, active sites and negatively charged uh, components in the, in the oil phase and bridge, uh, create ion bridges. And in this case, uh, we can have a surface that is negatively charged, uh, being attracted to, uh, attracting a, a, a component that has a negative charge due to this ion bridge. So let's talk a little more uh, about the acid-base interactions. And we, we can start talking about the rocks and we can start, start talking about sandstones. And its main, main constituent is quartz, uh, that is a silicate. And for the silicate, we have a very different chemistry than from carbonates. But when, when we have uh, the, the silica surface in contact with the nanacus phase, it will uh, develop active, uh, acid active sites in which uh, we, we will see that uh, these active sites are the silane and they can, uh, they can donate the proton acting as a weak acid and then they will be negatively charged uh, basically at a ne neutral pH or at typical reservoir conditions because the point of, of zero charge for this is around pH uh, two or two or point something. So usually very, very acid environments. Uh, so, uh, with that in mind, we will have an uh, acid size distribution and we will have basically a negative char uh, charge on, on the overall surface. And as we can uh, imagine, this, uh, this uh, acid active size that will interact with the bases on the, in the uh, dissolving the oil, so the oil can have acid and basic compounds. And the bases have a tendency to interact with the, with the acid sites, as we, we can see in this, uh, this scheme in the first reaction. And they, they will be uh, physically uh, attracted. And with that, we can uh, form this type of uh, electrostatic attractive bond in which it's not a chemical bond. So it will be a, a, a weak interaction, but it, will, it can be enough to alter the wettability uh, in that case. So we can see uh, with molecules in the, with, with a type of nitrogen content uh, base uh, on the reaction on the bottom, we can see this example in which the negatively charged uh, silica surface or quartz surface <coughs> can interact with the positively charged base at the, uh, and, and alter the wettability. When we have a stronger acid in the environment, a stronger that is the, the, the silane, uh, for example, uh, acetic acid in this case, or any type of other organic acid, we can have this re uh, wettability reversal. That means that uh, the, the acid will uh, compete with the silane, and then we, it will restore the initial wettability of the acid side because it will interact more strongly than, with the base than the surface of the rock. So that's, that's the case when we have, for example, uh, acidity in order to dissolve part of the molecules that are, uh, that are absorbed in the, in the rock, in the, on the surface of the rock. So if we can inject acids, we will kind of clean the rock. That means we will uh, remove the interaction between the surface of the rock uh, and the oil uh, components. We can see that this is also the case in, in some cases in CO2 injection. We can see in the study cases in the, in the end of the part. Then if we talk about calcite, a calcite is a major constituent of the, of the carbonate rocks and it develops a basic sites. So the basic sites as opposite uh, that was what we saw with uh, quartz, they will interact with acid components in the oil. For example, we have the reaction here with an organic acid and then uh, it will, it will uh, follow uh, the normal acid-base uh, uh, reaction causing this attraction between the, the, the organic uh, molecule and the active site and with that change in the wettability towards all wet. Then when we have a stronger, if we have a stronger base uh, than the solid active site, uh, for example, injection of uh, uh, sodium hydroxide, uh, 
we can have this wettability reversal in which, as we saw before for the acids, in this case, the stronger base will interact strongly, more strongly with the acid than the, the surface of the rock. And then with that, we will restore the wettability to its initial conditions. And now talking a little bit about the components we have in the oil. We have the acid components and the basic components uh, that are important for this mechanism of wettability alteration. So the acid components are mainly carboxylics or another type of organic acids. Uh, and the, the, the standard test to quantify the acidity of the oil is the acid number, total acid number, in which there we use a, a titration, the, the most commonly one is potentiometric uh, titrations, to measure the amount of uh, sodium, uh, potassium hydroxide, uh, milligrams of potassium hydroxide <coughs> required to neutralize one gram of oil. So there's a standard procedure in the ASTM uh, to measure the, the, the acid number. Uh, and usually this is a, a very important way to, to characterize the total acidity. But then, as we will see, uh, sometimes it's not enough because the, the strength of these reactions or the strength of these attractions will not only depend on the total uh, number of molecules that we have, it uh, also will depend on the type of functional groups and the strength of the acidity they have. So uh, usually it's a good way to characterize, but uh, we need to support this with some other complementary analysis, like for example, elemental analysis or infrared spectroscopy. Bases uh, are mainly mm, uh, nitrogen compounds, uh, organic compounds also that have uh, hetero atoms, uh, basically uh, containing nitrogen. And in this case, uh, they can be uh, mostly weak bases uh, and they will be characterized by the total base number. Uh, and this total base number, this, this will be an analog to the, the total acid number, but then it will quantify the amount of perchloric acid required to neutralize one gram of the oil. And then it will be expressed as equivalence in, in, in potassium hydroxide to correlate with the, bus, with the total acid number. So we also have a, a, a ASTM standard procedure to measure the, uh, the TBN. So for the acid-base uh, interactions, uh, as I was saying, it will, it, sometimes it's not only uh, important to know the concentration of acid and bases, but also their functional groups. And that is because the state, uh, uh, the more stable form or the more, the, the more concentrated form of the acid and the base will depend on the pH, but also depend on, the, on their acid and, and basic uh, equilibrium constants. Right, so this is, I know this is a basic uh, chemistry, but sometimes we don't really remember about this. But then when we have an acid in solution and when we have a base in solution, we have these equilibrium reactions in which uh, the dissociation equilibrium reactions, they will turn into a, an ionized form of the acid and of the base that can have a positive or negative charge, depending if, if they release a proton or they release a, a OH group. Uh, and the constant of equilibrium they will give us the relationship between the, the ionized and the non-ionized form of the basic and the acid, and then the pH, basically, because we have also the H plus or the OH minus in, into the, the, the constant. Uh, so basically, we, we need to know the Ka or the Kb, and this is so hard to, to, to know in the, in the, for the oil, because we are not talking about the model uh, substance. We are talking about a very complex uh, a multi-component phase which has a lot of different acids that can have a lot of bases at the same time. Uh, so it's, it's a very complex area. We need to research this if we want to try to get the, the total strength of basicity and acidity uh, of a specific type of oil. But the idea here that I want to give is that depending on the, on the, on the pH number, we will have a concentration of H and OH. And depending on that, we will have a concentration, a higher or lower uh, uh, concentration of the ionized or non-ionized form 
Uh, so, for example, we can see that for the acid, uh, when we go to a very low pH or a very high H plus concentrations, we will tend to have more non-ionized form. And then as the pH uh, increases and we go to, to a more neutral or basic compounds, we will start increasing the concentration or, or having more concentration of the, the negatively charged one. And for the basis, is the opposite behavior. If we go uh, to very high pHs, we will have a non-ionized form. And then when we, re when we decrease the pH, uh, we, we decrease the pH and go to a more neutral or acid conditions, we tend to have higher concentrations of the, of the uh, positively charged uh, form. So this is just an example that summarizes this, uh, in which we have uh, that we, we need to balance the attractive and repulsive forces. And this is uh, important to, to understand the type of rock we have, because we saw the, that the pH play, plays a major role, and also the type of prime, the, the concentration of ions, uh, and the minerals we have, but also the type of, of components we have in the, in the, in, in the oil. Uh, so basically, as I was saying before, quartz uh, has a point of zero charge at acid, uh, so as well, it will be negative. And then calcite, it will be typically positively charged at most pH of the reservoir conditions because uh, it will have the point of zero charge only for pH is very high. I think it's around nine or something like this. Uh, and then the type of acid and basic compounds depend on, on, on the TA, TAN and TBN, but also the type of molecules we have. So in the example, if we see there on the figure, we can see that we have the Fisher silica as a model, model in the uh, sandstone rock. And then we have the California crude oil. And we can see that uh, 6.8, around 6.8 is a, a point of change at which we will have uh, at lower pHs, we will have electrostatic attraction, meaning that we will have uh, non-water wet because the oil will have a strong interaction with the surface of the silica. But then if we go to higher uh, pH values, we will have an electrostatic uh, repulsion, meaning that we have mostly uh, uh, the surface active compounds of the oil negatively charged and they will, uh, uh, will have repulsion with the negatively charged quartz surface. Uh, silica surface. And then uh, the, that gives us idea that at, at lower pH, these bases that are positively charged are playing a major role in, in wettability alteration. But then when we go to neutral and, uh, and basic pH, they lose this, they, they are neutralized, they lose their charge, and then the acids that may be negatively charged, they have a stronger in interaction. So why is this important in recovery, uh, actually? So I want to show that this uh, makes a, a major role in, 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 in displacement of the fluids. So I will try to show this briefly in examples. And we start talking about the, the capillary pressure. So I put three example curves from the Donaldson book. Uh, so the water wet curve, the neutral, and the oil wet. And we can see uh, the shape of the curves is really different. but why or how? Well, first, if we go through the to the uh, water wet part, we can see uh, that for the primary drainage, that is the curve number one, we can see that it has a, a relatively high uh, displacement pressure, entry pressure. Uh, that means that to reduce the saturation of water and to actually start injecting the, the non-wetting phase, the oil phase, uh, we will have to to overcome this high pressure here. And also we can see that he, uh, once we did the, the primary drainage and we go for the, the first inhibition, uh, this is a, a strongly water case, a water wet case. So we can see that we have a, a, a part of the curve, of the inhibition curve that is spontaneous. So that happens at, at, at positive capillary pressure. So that means we, I don't need any, any pressure to force this water in. And then we have a force inhibition part that is the number three. So we have uh, inhibition can be separated into spontaneous and force inhibition. 
And then when we go to the oil, we don't have any spontaneous inhibition, uh, spontaneous entry. We can see that we need actually another displacement pressure, entry pressure, to do the secondary drainage part. So that represents that we have a completely water wet uh, core. And if we go to, to the neutral wet, we can see that the spontaneous, uh, we, we don't have a very high entry pressure for any of the cores of the spaces because uh, they are they they have uh, the same tendency to enter and exit the, the core but then also we can see that the the ratio of spontaneous and force uh, entry for both the oil and brine are the same so we have kind of a symmetric curve here this represents that we have a similar interaction with the with the rock with the oil and the brine And in the oil case, we have the opposite, right? So we, we, if we go to entry pressure, so it's the opposite of the water wet. So oil has a tendency to, to enter the, 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 the rocks, so we don't have any, any uh, requirement of pressure. And then when we go to, uh, to have any, uh, any spontaneous inhibition, and we actually see that we need we have an entry pressure, but now it's for the water. So seeing that this is this uh, the roles are reversed here, and the water needs pressure to enter, and the oil has a tendency to enter spontaneously. So the some uh, standards or very not standards but very accepted procedures in the industry to to infer wettability. Uh, one of them is the AMOT test. And it's actually based on the ratio between spontaneous and total inhibition for each phase. So uh, what we will do, we will do cycles of a spontaneous inhibition and plug saturation with saturated with brine. We place it in a in a cell like the one shown in the figure there, and then we will have a, a we will read the amount of oil that is will, uh, of brine that will be displaced by the oil by spontaneous inhibition. That means without applying any driving force of, of pressure, we will see how much oil imbibs, imbibs the, the, the uh, force, the, the plug spontaneously and how much water is displaced. We, we will need to perform this as for as long days as needed as to see no incremental displaced water. And then after that, we can use a centrifuge or we can use a core flooding apparatus to perform the force inhibition part in which we will inject the oil until reaching the, the SWY uh, or the reducible water saturation and then measure the, the total brine that was displaced at the force step. And then we will go backwards when we have a, a core saturated uh, with oil and we will use the AMOT cell to measure the spontaneous inhibition part, uh, and then we will perform the force uh, injection of, of, of water until reaching the residual oil saturation, uh, and with that measuring the, the amount that was displaced by force inhibition of force injection. And with that, we have the AMOT, the AMOT index uh, that will relate the spontaneous to total inhibition for each of the phases. So we have the delta O that is it represents the displacement by oil. So we will measure the volume of water that was displaced by oil spontaneously over the total volume of water that was displaced by oil. And then for the brine, we have uh, the delta W that will give us the volume of oil that was displaced by brine spontaneously divided by the total volume of oil that was displaced. So the amount index, the I, it will be the differences between the delta W and the delta O. So meaning that if it's uh, greater than zero, uh, we will have a greater spontaneous displacement by brine, meaning that the, the, the rock is more water wet than oil wet. And if we have a negative value, we will have a greater tendency to a spontaneous inhibition by oil, uh, meaning that the, the oil, uh, the core will be more water wet, more oil wet. So usually we have these uh, ranges in which uh, water wet is uh, for values higher than 0 0.3, uh, oil wet for values lower than minus 0 0.3, and then the intermediate wet will be in between. Then another uh, very used uh, procedure is the USBM, that it will compare 
it will be based in, in, in the work required to displace one phase by the other one. So uh, it's, uh, it's logical to expect that the wedding phase will require less work to displace the non wedding phase than the opposite around because it has more tendency to enter, right? So we will have, we will have to, to, uh, to apply less work uh, in order to inject the wedding phase. So that's the whole base of this, uh, uh, in which we know that the, this is a, a pressure volume curve, but basically the capillary pressure saturation curve. So we know that the, the work will be proportional to the area below the, the, each curve. And so if we take the course for the uh, force injection of oil and for the force injection of water, we can get uh, the proportionality of the work required to forcefully inject oil and force inject prime, and we can do a ratio between both of them. So basically, we have the force uh, oil injection that will be a curve number five here, and then we have the force water injection that will be the curve number three here. So then we have we can take the areas below these curves if we plot the curves, and then uh, we can calculate an index that it will be uh, the log of of this ratio and that, that to be positive or negative depending on, on the values of areas we have. So if we have a, a, a W index, uh, that is the, the, ratio, the log of the ratios that is uh, positive, we will have more water wet behavior. Why is that? Because, well, that means that the, the, the area under the, uh, below the, the oil curve will be greater. Uh, Meaning that we needed more work to introduce the oil uh, phase. So if we have a, a negative value, we will have the opposite behavior. And then for values around zero, we will have an, a, a neutral wet behavior. So that's the overall idea of this, that for that we need to perform the complete force inhibition and, and uh, for oil, force injection of, uh, of oil and force injection of water either in a core flooding or mostly in a centrifuge that is uh, usually faster. So to talk about this, the, the effects on relative permeability, uh, as we can expect, we know that the wettability affects the distribution of the phases uh, through the pores, so the connectivity of them, and also which pore will be in the larger pores, which fluid will be in the larger pores, which fluid will be in the smaller pores, and which fluid will form films uh, and which fluid will have a more tendency to uh, enter and get stuck in the rock compared to the other phase. So it's obvious to expect that we will have an, an effect of wettability into a, a relative permeability curves. This is a very uh, uh, illustrative example that uh, compares uh, from the curve number one that is a strongly water wet to the curve number five that is a, a all wet. Uh, we can see the effects of, of, of the, the changes in wettability in, in cores that are the similar cores because they were, these were uh, standard cores that were uh, coated uh, using different procedures to alter wettability. So we can see the basic, the, the obvious uh, differences we see is that when we have a, a water wettability, the higher the, the water wettability is, the lower the, the real perm of the water goes. Uh, and part, this is particularly true for the endpoint relative permeability. As we can see, the number one has an endpoint relative permeability uh, for water that is much lower than number five, for example. That means um, that for the higher water saturation, we have a lower flow capacity, meaning that, uh, that since water is strongly wet in here, oil, the, the, the residual oil that we have will still occupy larger pores and will have strong influence on the displacement of water, opposed to uh, the cases in, uh, in which we have uh, oil wettability, that the oil will be, will be distributed in the smaller pores and forming films and water won't be so much affected uh, at, the residual, at the end point. Also, we can see that in the shape of the curves, we can see differences in the crossover points. So the crossover points is intersection of the curves, and that's an important point because it, it will mean uh, the saturation at which both phases have the same flow capacity or the same relative permeability. Uh, we know that we, when we increment the, the water wettability, uh, we, we can see that the, the, 
crossover points, they will shift to the right to, to, towards higher uh, water saturations. And that means that we need to have a higher water, uh, water saturation in the, in the plug or in the core in order to get the same uh, relative probability than for oil. So the, the more water wet behavior we have, the more water we need in the system so it, it will flow with the same capacity than the oil. So this is uh, commonly used as a QC for water uh, for uh, relative permeability curves. Is when if we know the wettability, we know what type of behavior we expect. And please note that this is uh, just a QC and it's not a, it's not a written in stone. Uh, it's some QCs that some laboratories or researchers adopt uh, uh, to 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 evaluate the relative permeability curves. Uh, this I took them specifically from the book of reservoir engineering by Tarek Ahmed, uh, and we they suggest as QC values that the crossover should be lower than 0 0.5 for water wet and lower than 0 0.5 for all wet cores, and also that the endpoint uh, relative probability to water that means the the relative probability to water at one minus SOR should be lower than 0 0.3 for water wet and greater than 0 0.5 for all wet. This is not always the case, but it's just a, an idea. And then the SWI, this is not always the case. And I also, I, I, I know a lot of well-known researchers that disagree with this, but then the SWI should be higher for the water wet and lower uh, for the oil wet. And then just to, to to finish the last part, uh, I will show some case studies that are from Brazil and from the Prisal. Uh, so first, an overview of the Prisal and why it's important and why we are all researching the Prisal so hard here. Uh, the oil and gas industry has been going through a, a huge change in Brazil for the last years, and we, we can see this is our, the basins, the uh, post cells, and, and and northeast offshore are the are the basins that don't, do not include the pre-salt fields production uh, for uh, the offshore, uh, and then we can see that uh, most of the fields are uh, within the declining part of the curves, you know, it's meaning that they are reducing their productions. And on the other hand, we we have these huge discoveries uh, of pre-salt fields uh, which are offshore and which are which have been incremented in their, their production for the last years, year after year. And they have been taking a, a very important place in the future of the oil industry here in Brazil. Uh, and also incrementing the fraction of the, the uh, total amount of, of production, oil production in Brazil throughout the years. So as, as the offshore postal kept, con kept constant or is slowly declining, the, the pre-salt is taking a, an, an important role and it's important for us to research both the, the pre-salt and the post-salt because we want to, uh, to increase the recovery factor in, when, when the post-salt fields are considered mature, but also uh, we want to know how to explore and how to produ produce in the offshore pre-salt fields uh, and be prepared to the challenges in the, in the future. So just uh, some data, I took the data from the uh, Petroleum Agency in Brazil, but I took the data in 2019 because I, I chose to forget this crazy year uh, about production, just to give you an idea of, of how the production was meaningful of the pre-sale. So in December 2019, there were 114 wells producing 2,117 a million barrels uh, of, of oil, no, 2.117 million barrels of oil uh, per day. And it represented almost 70% of the total production of Brazil. So uh, one year ago, it was only 55. So now it's 66. So it has been, uh, the share of production has been incrementing uh, during the last years. The average recovery factor in Brazil uh, is considered low due to many factors. It's not only lack of efficiency, but also the type of reserves and, and the focus on the pre-sale that, uh, that uh, altered the, the development of EOR techniques for mature fields and some other things. But the important thing is that increasing 1% of recovery to be 
we increase in huge royalties and, and increase in reserves. So it's very important that we uh, understand these this fields and we understand how to model them and how to develop them. And for the ones that are not familiar with the environment, this is just to see some of the challenges we have. They are very heterogeneous carbon and rocks. Uh, they have very high salinity brines, over 200,000 ppm, uh, with high concentration of the valent uh, cations. Uh, they are ultra deep waters uh, and a salt layer of over two. So easily we can have over uh, five kilometers of, of total depth or more. And some of the fields have a very high concentration of CO2 in the produced gas. So uh, this is important because we will see in the, some of the examples that this is important for enhanced recovery for WAG applications, but also it's important because we need to take this into account when we model the, the <coughs> oil fluid behaviors. So this is the first uh, example that I, I, I'm showing to you. Um, this is a, an experimental study that we, we did a combination of wettability characterization and SCAL in order to see the effects of carbonation brine uh, on the displacement uh, of oil by, by, by water and, and, and carbonated brine injection under pre-salt conditions. And for this, you can see an example of example. Uh, you have the brine D, that is the, the formation water for the field that we were targeting. And also this is the, the and we have the DSW, that is the disulfated seawater that is considered injection water. And also a characterization of the oil in which we, you, you have the SAR analysis and you have the total acid number, total base number, the API and the, the viscosity and the solubility of CO2. You can see that uh, we have a, High concentration of of, of, resins, of resins and a non uh, negligible concentration of asphaltines. Also, we have a high basic number, but also we have a non negligible acid number. So this oil has a, a high concentration of sulfur active compounds, and it is has a high strong interaction with the rock. So we can see that at high pressure and high temperature contact angle measurements. Uh, we can see uh, uh, these measurements uh, perform uh, for limestone um, for the pre-salt rocks. Limestone was, was used as a, as a model rock. This is an Indiana limestone used as a model rock to uh, simulate this, this, this uh, pre-salt rock. But also we have some, uh, some uh, pieces of rock in which we could perform contact angle measurements. And we can see that uh, for the aged rock without any CO2, we have a very oil wet condition as we can, you can see in the image and you can see also on the bar plot there, we can see contact angles that went as high as 170, 160 after 30 days of aging. That means that that Sorry, what's that? Okay. Sorry for that. Go ahead. It was a noise from someone. Ah, okay. I thought it was a question. No worries. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll continue. So we can see that there was a very uh, strong oil wet condition after 30 days of aging. Um, we didn't find this the very strong condition for the mineral uh, of quartz and the mineral of, of dolomite. So this gives us an idea of the stronger interaction in the limestone and, and in the deep rock comes from the interactions with calcite. Uh, but when we added a carbonated brine in the system, we can see a reduction of the of the all wet behavior. And we can see that both the limestone and the crystal rock, they went to a intermediate wet from the very uh, strongly all wet to an intermediate wet behavior. Uh, in which we, we find contact angles of 90 and 105 degrees. So when we studied a, a little further this, we did some characterizations of the rocks, uh, CM characterization. 
participation and and the uh, uh, focal microscopy characterization, we could analyze the surface of the rock after uh, the, the test, and we could see that, the, as we saw before, these interactions, we could see that there was a strong interaction between the, the, the carbonated brine and the rock, and this uh, removed the interaction the, of, the, of the solid active size with, with the oil. So that explains why we, we saw a decrease in the oil wet behavior. We can see that the Kofuka microscopy showed a much increased surface heterogeneity and a, a much, much increased uh, effects of, uh, of corrosion by the acid attack. And also uh, we can see that uh, the same in when we compare the, the pre-salt rock before and after carbonated brine injection. And we can see uh, the shapes of, of the surface uh, much more uh, pristine and clear on the on the on the on the uh, native core than compared in, uh, on the on the core after carbonated brine injection, in which we can see clear signs of abrasion and, and acid attack. And also, we perform a core flooding experiment uh, uh, for SCAL. Here to compare the displacement, this was not to, to, to produce the, the relative permeability curves, it was to compare the displacement between uh, sulfate seawater injection and carbonated uh, seawater injection. And we can see that uh, after we had a plateau after the secondary recovery uh, in, in six, almost 60% uh, recovery, but then after injection carbonated brine injection, we 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 have uh, almost a 30 percent increase in all recovery uh, and we saw we attributed this to the the changes in the re, in the interactions between uh, oil and brine uh, between the oil and the surface reducing the wettability towards soil but also uh, some other effects like viscosity decrease of the oil and visibility can be important <coughs> in addition we perform uh, a micro CT analysis to, to study the wormholes created by the dissolution and a treasure test to see the, the sweeping front. And we could see that actually this rock fluid interaction created a wormhole at the, at the limestone uh, rock. And it's important to characterize uh, that, that this could end up have, uh, producing damage in the core and this could end up having an a, a impact in the sweeping efficiency because we have a dissolution and then precipitation in other parts of the core. So we can see in the treasure test, we can see that we have a, this tailing effect that shows that the, 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 the sample with a wormhole will show a much less homogeneous uh, sweeping than the one that doesn't have the wormhole before the test. So this is a second uh, example uh, that I just wanted to show you because this is characterizing the, the fluid fluid interactions. And in this case, we can see uh, how, what is the effect of adding carbonated brine or adding CO2 in the system, both in the oil and, and in the brine. What is the effects in the, in the, in the interfacial tension? So you have a characterization of the, of the oil and the brine used in this, in this case. Uh, it's, a, it's another piece of oil, uh, but also it has a high concentration of resins and asphaltins and a high basic, basic number uh, and a non-negligible acid number. And what's important here is that usually what we expect for a paraffinic oil is that CO2 dissolution will decrease the interfacial tension. So if you see the orange bars in the plot here, we can see that for carbonated brine, we have a huge decrease in the pH, but then and for the orange bars, we have we can see for for the, the decrease in the interfacial tension, and those orange bars represent a model oil in which we use aromatics and and paraffin, a paraffin and aromatic uh, mixture, uh, synthetic mixture, to keep the same saturate uh, saturate and aromatic uh, ratio of the crude oil. 
but we, we didn't consider any asphalting and resin, just to see the effects on the, on the simple uh, alkane and aromatic uh, sample. But then when we go to the crude oil, that is the blue bars, we can see that CO2 dissolution actually uh, increased IFT, showing that the, the interfacial activity of the oil was actually decreased by CO2 interaction. So we wanted to see if this was, has a special relationship with the pH, that that's what we expected. So we did uh, control pH experiments, uh, controlling with buffer systems uh, uh, the pH from very acid to very basic or, uh, environments, and with a very high increase uh, in the interfacial tension. As so that the, the interfacial tension effects here, the, 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 the acids here are the ones that are more responsible to the basis, even though that we have a TAN uh, over TBN a ratio lower than one, uh, we can see that when we, when we deactivate the, uh, the acid components and we go to a, to a very acid environment, uh, we have a higher IFT, meaning that they will show a lower, uh, a, a, a lower interaction with the brine phase. So that's, uh, uh, we have some other characterizations that I didn't include because I, I thought we didn't have time, but then we have infrared spectroscopy there, general meter analysis also for, for this case. So, so we could actually understand that uh, TAN and TBN are very important, but they're not the only thing that classifies interactions. And, and this was in agreement with some other previous uh, results for, for other uh, crude oil conditions. And then the last, to, to finish up, uh, this is a very recent publication, actually from this month, in which we did an experimental and digital workflow uh, together to com we combine uh, measurements, experimental measurements to reconstruct a coquina that is an analog for some precell fields, an outcrop analog for some precell fields. And we combine some, some, uh, some digital uh, reconstruction from, from the CT scan in order to perform pore scale simulator, simulations and to see the effects of the, of the wettability alteration uh, when we inject the carbonated brine. So here we, we uh, characterize the rock with, with NMR to actually reconstruct uh, the pore size distribution curve and with that to see the cumulative curve and to check the, the, the size of, of the resolution of the tomography we need to represent more, more, most of the pores. And we can see that for 10 uh, micrometers, we can capture most of the dominant uh, flow system. And with that, we acquired uh, the, the micro CT scans for the, for the uh, crop volume in order to perform uh, flow calculations. Uh, with this, we use a pore that is a PNM tool, uh, and, and we perform flow, uh, flow calculations to calculate capillary pressure and electric permeability. But before that, we did the characterization of the IFT that I showed some results before, but also the characterization of the, uh, of the wettability for 15 days of aging. We see that for all brine interactions, we have uh, an intermediate wet, and then for uh, carbonated brine interactions, we, we have a, a water wet. So we can see that the an H core is completely water wet. Then when we, we go to the H core, we have an intermediate wet. And then if we go to uh, the H core, but using CO, uh, CO2 or using carbonated brine, we have a, a, a less in, uh, uh, oil wet or a, a, a weekly water wet conditions. So there was a wettability shift uh, by the decrease in pH and by the carbonated brine injection. And uh, with that, we use the, the we compare the drainage primary drainage uh, capillary pressure curves with the centrifuge curves for QC of the of the porous system represented, and we got a good agreement. And also, we we perform the, the inhibition curves for using the parameters for the edge rock uh, uh, for uh, oil brine system or for oil carbonated brine system. And we can see that this is a pore scale uh, relative permeability. So in order to get it to field scale, uh, some 
procedure of scaling, procedures complex procedures should be done. And also, we didn't consider mineral dissolution here. So the idea was this was not to perform a recovery or, or, or reservoir simulations with this, was to isolate the effects of wettability shift and to see how it impacts the, the, the displacement of the fluids. And we can see that we have, we, we found for shift in the crossover point uh, to higher water saturations and a decrease in the end point of, of, of water relative permeability, showing us we expected that the increase will actually be beneficial for the, the flow of oil and will increase the flow capacity of oil for most of the, of the saturations at the core. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you for the opportunity for showing this for you. Uh, for, uh, and I, these are my two contacts from Halliburton and from uh, and in the university email. So if you, you have any questions, I don't know if we will have a lot of time right now for, for, for discussions, but then feel free to contact me at any point uh, at either of these emails and I can provide you the references so we can discuss any other, uh, any other things if you are interested in. And also I have some sum up the references here for this uh, presentation. Uh, and I think that's it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Santiago, for this informative uh, lectures. Uh, now we have, I think, just 10 minutes for questions and answers. I think there is one question in the chat, if you can. Can you read it or should I read it for you? No, let me, I just stop sharing so I can. Uh, okay. Okay, read it. so if there is high heterogeneity according to mineralogy and this causes different wettability regions, what is the suitable displacing fluid or how we treat with this case in AOR? Well, yeah, this is a very uh, broad question because it will it will depend a lot of the type of of uh, of, of uh, heterogeneity in, in mineralogy we are talking about, uh, and basically the type of fluid that we use can can have different effects. As we said, for example, for carbonates, uh, you if if we are treating it with a fluid that will be acid, we can expect to have some. Dissolution. So the rate of dissolution will depend on the, the mineralogy distribution on the surface, basically. So it, it's not the same if we have a dolomite that is more resistant uh, to acid attack than if we have a calcite. And also if you have a quartz, for example, uh, in between all of that. So the distribution of the mineralogy is really important when we consider uh, specifically fluids that have changes in the pH. Uh, for example, WAG or, or CO2 injection or acid stimulation also. Then I'm not even talking about the clays that are a separate uh, world. Uh, so in that case, we can, have a, a, we can have a very specific effects also. And then uh, if you're talking about some other, other uh, cases of UR, for example, we need to consider the surface charge in order, for example, for surfactants. If we want the surfactants, uh, if we are planning UR for surfactants, surfactants for uh, changing the wettability, you want to maximize so the charge of the surfactant in the aqueous solution that you will inject needs to be needs to have a high interaction with it, with the, the the rock. But then in the opposite case, when when we want actually the surfactant for capillary number improvement. Uh, we want to reduce the, the absorption of the surfactant. So we need to take into account the mineralogy the heterogeneities to be able to or coat the, the active parts with uh, some other flu uh, for some other more uh, less expensive uh, component or, uh, or see how to tune the, 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 the chemistry of the fluid that you are injecting in order to avoid uh, Massive losses of the the, surf, the, the surfactant with the with the uh, within the rock by absorption. So yeah, I think uh, uh, it's, it has to be very very specifically considered for for each 
part and also the distribution, the stereogenesis can be in some regions, so you need to see the target injection area, right? And if you, you are expecting the injected fluid to migrate, the EOR injected fluid to migrate throughout the, the whole heterogeneous parts or not. We can have layers, for example, we can have uh, layers that have different properties than others. So in, in those cases, we need to do selective uh, injections at the different depths. Uh, so I think it's, it's, very, it's very broad. We, we, we can have a lot of different cases and the optimum type of fluid of, of process uh, will depend of, on all these interactions. So I think during the lecture, I tried to show uh, how specific this is for the environment. So it will not only depend on the and the distributions, and not only depend on the type of oil, but also it will depend on, on the type of uh, you inject, because all these equilibriums can be uh, completely uh, modified when we inject something like, for example, CO2 that will alter the pH and with that it will cause this solution precipitation. So, so I think with that in mind is something that we need to go case by case and, and try to understand with all the tools we have and the knowledge, try to characterize the more that we have. I, I hope I, with this lecture I showed that it's important to know how to 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 understand this, and it's not just, well, putting some contact angle in the pore scale analy analysis or just fitting Cori uh, relative permeability in the reservoir simulator and forget about the, the wettability and the interactions. Okay, thank you. So we have just four minutes left. So any other questions? Ah, I think I, I see some, some other, I don't know if from now or before, but it's the permeability calculations for Amcore well. And then there's a second question that says that if we can use CO2 instead of water in insole recovery. Okay, so uh, for the Amcore well, uh, what I can say it's again, it depends a lot on how we can relate uh, one well to the other. So uncored, uncored wells, usually when we have a, a well-behaved formations, uh, this should be pretty straightforward because we, we can correlate, uh, for example, logs uh, pretty well if we know the properties and it shouldn't be a, a major problem. What we see here in, in the pre-cell, I can talk about our experience here because it's more interesting because it's more complex. We have to develop this in a, a for each reservoir because for for example for core wells uh, in some uh, reservoirs we can see that some cores resemble and are analog from some from to others and some others are completely a whole different story and we need to build a, a, a new uh, a, a new methodology to characterize anisotropy and characterize permeability uh, in a in a in a well-to-well -well basis. So I think it, it depends very much so in, in how uh, conventional or how easy your distributions are. Here in Brazil, we usually, uh, we use ingrain a lot because of that, because it's so complicated that we try to build models in, in terms of tomography. Not only, in, we have tried to relate the wells, the, the, C, the core CT to the logs, and then with that, build models that we can apply to uncore wells. So it's much more complex, but when we have a, 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 a well-behaved or something that we can correlate, it's something much more direct. And then for the second question, I, don't, I think you, you were talking about CO2 instead of uh, water, in, uh, you, you mean CO2 instead of carbonated brine or CO2 instead of water flooding? I don't know if the person who asked is uh, online. Okay, I think maybe they they have gone already. So 
So, well, you can get in touch with me later uh, by email and we can discuss this for sure. Uh, so feel free to contact me for anything. Uh, I'm really open for collaborations all the time and for discussions. Uh, so I, either at my Halliburton email or my uh, university email. Uh, and I hope you, you enjoy this, this talk. Okay, thank you so much. It was really informative and outstanding lectures. Okay, thank you very much guys for staying to the end. <laughs> and I hope to be in touch with you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to end the meeting now. Okay, have a great evening. You too.